Do you have the gift of gab and like talking about interesting topics? Are you often called opinionated by your friends and family? Then come to Anchor where you can be all of the above and get paid for it. Along with being one of the easiest systems to create contact with, Anchor supplies everything you need and can be used from your smart smartphone or computer. They even distribute your content for you so that you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Just download the A- Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. Okay. Hello, Internet family. This is Anjanette Potter, also known as Adams Rib, and you are listening to 28 Days of Black Feminism, um, courtesy of the Anjanette Speak blog from WordPress. So as I promised, I am going to be doing two podcasts a night, um, except for this, except for Friday simply because especially this Friday I'm going to be um, doing live broadcast so um, it is with heavy heart that I announce that a funk legend rock legend um, queen of funk has lost her battle with life so um, I Mary I mean Lord have mercy Betty Davis, um, the um, ex-wife of Miles Davis, um, has passed away today. So um, it's, you know, kind of been all over the place. So there are some people, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, as a fan of hers, I am a little late to the game as far as being a fan of hers. Um, I, I like unlike a lot of artists that I liked and admired and loved their music um, where I was a day one I was a little late to the party when it came to Miss Davis um, now if you're wondering if you're a fan of old old black and white cinema and everything we're not referring to Betty Davis who was a rival of Joan Crawford I am referring to the Betty Davis that I am referring to is an African-American songwriter, singer, musician, and sort of the pioneer of, like we call Tina Turner, the um, queen of rock. We call um, Aretha Franklin, the queen of soul. We call Mary J. Blige, the queen of hip hop soul. Betty Davis, Betty Betty Davis was kind of heralded as being one of the unspoken uns, uh, unspoken um, queens of funk, and uh, and an earned title. So if you really want to know, I'm I'm gonna t- I'm gonna give you know some information on her this Friday. So she so she is added to the. Um, playlist that I have posted already for the people that I'm going to be honoring this Friday so she goes on that list I added her um, I must play you know some of her music too um, one way to know a little bit more about her there's a series that I was looking at on YouTube um, that was done by Mike Judge the same guy who did King of the Hill He did a series called Tales from the Tour Bus. And in this, and he covered all genres of music. So he talked about the country people, but he also talked about Rick James and Prince and George, George, um, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, Bootsy Collins. And he also did a segment on Betty Davis. So um, if you want to know a little bit of, you know, what she was like to work at work with and different stories that people told about her back in the day, um, that's a good source to listen to. You also can, um, like I said, I will be I will be reading from her reading her biographical information from um, her Wikipedia page. Um, If you're still listening to Spotify or any of the streaming services, you can, um, I, and I had meant to dedicate a broadcast to her, um, before now, and so it's terrible that now I get to talk about her, 
but I would have liked to have been able to talk about her in the land of the living. So she will get celebrated um, this month and everything she'll get celebrated this Friday. I'm considering it depends on, you know, what I read about her, whatever, whether or not I will be talking about her. I may talk about her some more. Um, So this week, you know, of course, we're dedicating um, the um, podcast to the, um, to the versus program but we're also going to be dedicating it to this week's to this Saturday night's concert here in Columbus Ohio the um Ohio um love affair Valentine's love affair um with the artist that I talked about uh, so I will be mentioning her I will be talking about her then I may even go into more depth because the uh, next week next weekend I, I'm not gonna I, I, what I'm gonna do with the podcast is do it maybe every other week so this Friday I will be li- I will be live broadcasting at midnight next week I won't be and then the following one I will be do- the podcast will be dedicated to um, black exploitation and I my discussion as I celebrate those artists will be whether was it really exploitation or was it really black exploitation or was it a black renaissance of sorts so I'll be talking about that because it wasn't just movies it was books you know urban urban literature urban fiction it was also it was also the music that was um around at that time too and I tell you what there was some musical genius being birthed at that time and I'll discuss what the meaning of the word renaissance is because it wasn't just the renaissance period that we study in human in your humanities class where we talk about the Italian renaissance and different other renaissances that were going on in Europe but there was also the Harlem renaissance okay which is also largely black so when i look at um the se- the 70s black exploitation period i don't just see black exploitation which black exploitation is a um combination of the words black and exploitation and so in order for you to call it exploitation would you say that those that the that the, that the work was um, exploitive or would you say that it was basically because we've had a few periods the 90s we kind of had a little bit of a renaissance of black directors and uh, black black film directors and almost a neo soul movement that was going on during the 90s that was reminiscent of the black exploitation period and we're starting to get back into that flow now so this could almost be third or fourth wave when it comes to the renaissance type of you know people being real woke we now we're talking about being woke because our music is being used to um for a plat as a platform of sorts our art is being used to minister and to preach um, not just the word of God but also to address um, injustices and different things that are going on in the world um, I was listening to a favorite artist earlier um, there is a song by Lenny Kravitz that I like to listen to called what goes around comes around And I was like, gosh, this almost puts me in mind of Prince. And if you don't know, if you listen to some of his music, it it, it can be, it it takes you into the prophetic on some level. Because when people start to, one aspect of the prophetic is being a signer of the time. Observing the world we're in, oops, almost knocked my mic over. Observing the world that we're in and and being a reflection and basically saying, you know, you know, kind of pontificating on what's going on in the world. 
So um, many people, I call it waxing prophetic, when you are able to observe the times. And if you listen closely, like I've said before, and like I'm going to continue to say, do you think that God is speaking to us through this pandemic? Okay, because there are people who are messing with people over craziness. And I'm like, well, what do you think that God is saying through this pandemic? Now, you can make fun of me. You can talk smack to me. You can say stuff to me. But when it's all said and done, have you pressed through in your prayers? Have you really pressed and tried to figure out is God telling us something through this pandemic with this? Because God, you God, God, if you read the Old Testament, God has used plagues to send mankind a message. The word of God says that all things were together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So I'm going to continue to ask. And I'll be honest with you, even when I get off this mic, I may have to ask myself. You know, we have all these so-called prophets in the land. But what do you think God is saying with this particular pandemic? What do you think he's saying? Because we keep coming up with, um, we keep coming up with um, inoculations and vaccines. And, and this thing continues to keep, I, I remember saying that in the 80s you know, people's um, sexual sex drives and sexuality kept getting off the hook. And I'm like, yeah, we got cures. You can go and get a shot, take some pills and knock whatever that is right out. But I'm noticing that some of them sexually transmitted disease keep getting stronger. They keep being new strains and you have to come up with even stronger stuff to knock that stuff out. I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't be promiscuous, promiscuous today to save my mama's life. I couldn't be no prostitute. I couldn't be no sex worker. Men don't keep they, they stuff clean enough for me. For real. And now we're dealing with this pandemic. And now we have Omarion. Before that, we had another third wave. It's like we have the vaccines. And the vaccines, you know aren't 100% really no vaccine is not even birth control is 100% but it lessens the people who have got it even with being vaccinated said have said it's not it would be a whole lot worse without the vaccine that's what a lot of people aren't understanding like you can be anti-vaxxer with this thing but I would hate to see you get it and many of the people who were anti-vaccine in the past have gotten it and have said they wish they had got the vaccine because you ain't got no guarantee that you're going to make it out of that alive. People are dying. So this is what I'm saying. Do, Do you think there's a message in this pandemic? I don't think the pandemic is winning. Okay? But I do think, is there a message? Is Is this the devil attacking us? Or is this it or is this a message? Because God can use anything to talk to you and wake you up and get your attention. Okay? So it's something to think about. So the two um so I I I've said already that what I'm gonna do is do three notables and then a um topic. So tonight it's gonna be two notables. So the first notable um, I want to discuss is my grandmother's namesake. So um, I'm going to talk about Ida B. Wells Barnett. So um, my grandmother, um, for those people who are live around Maslin who may have be li- listening to it or may listen to this at a later date, um, is named um, Ida B. Pierce. And I remember thinking, I was telling my mom, I was like, there's an Ida B. I was looking at my black history, and I'm like, who is this Ida B. Wells? She's like, grandma's name. And so she said, actually, your grandmother was named after her. Which I thought, okay, that's interesting. My grandmother um, was kind of known around our our area for, for being a person 
who was full of a lot of wisdom. And I can remember, I still like, one of my favorite sayings by my grandmother is, misery loves company. Um, but she's always, she always kind of was very observant. I think in her day, if women could, um, if she could have been a child psychologist. My mother, my grandmother raised eight children. My mother is an only girl. She was next to the last. She was what they call a knee baby. Because she was like, there was one um, uncle younger than her. Um, My grandmother was a change of life baby. She was the youngest out of all her siblings. And she just seemed to be like right on point. She was very observant. I remember one of my cousins got into trouble and... You know, she had put some oatmeal in a goldfish bowl or something. And everybody, oh, she's just being bad. And my grandmother was like, she thought she was feeding goldfish. And they talked to that little, that particular little cousin. And she was like, I was just trying to feed him. <laughs> and so I've always been the type of person. I think that's one of the things that I do get from her is her ability to find humor even when kids act up. Because I tell people all the time, and I tell my ki- my two kids, I'm like, I was playing with one of um, my daughter's friends, little girls, and I looked at my daughter, I said, go back and be this Asia kid, because you guys were fun to raise. They were fun to raise because they, to me, they were fun, and they were fun to raise because, you know, just like my, my younger cousins were fun to watch, get into things because as and I look at my grandson now and just the fact that they they get older and they're discovering so much about the world and to look at the world through their eyes and see what they see and see a lot of what you see for the first time we took my um grant we took basically my grandchildren my daughter's um my daughter's my daughter's boyfriend has children from another relationship and so we took the kids out to look at the Christmas lights this year I was like I'm taking them out to look at the Christmas lights you know and we went and looked at the lights and to watch them see all of this Christmas wonderment and we took them to the nativity scene downtown Columbus and to watch them and to watch you know, the one that's my biological grand, they, they all three call me grandma. Um, and to watch them enjoy themselves and see these lights and everything. I remember the first time I took my son through the through some neighborhoods on the west side when I lived on the west side to look at Christmas lights and he was just, oh, mom, mom, look, look at the lights. The light and 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 they're just there's so much fun to watch as they discover new things. Um, that's why so many people post all these baby videos with baby taste babies tasting lemons and different stuff for the first time, and they realize, oh, that's a sour. Yeah, <laughs> what you give me this for? Or to watch them interact with their with their pets and everything. They just it's it's. They are, you know, I'm trying to remember um, which psychologist it was that called them little scientists because they're always looking around. That's why you have to put those little things over top of the um, socket. (laughs) That's why they make those little things for you to put over sockets in your house because as they're walking and everything like they think it's perfectly normal to stick a knife in a light socket and don't wonder and and don't think that it's gonna shock them they don't know they don't know anything about danger one of my favorite movies um was a john hughes movie the same guy who made the movie home alone with macaulay Culkin. well he made another movie called baby's day out and this movie, I, I like I like to pee on myself. This movie was so funny from beginning to end because this baby had no knowledge of danger. He was just, more, people were harming themselves, trying not to harm him. And he's just toddling on around just like it was nothing. And, and if you get a chance to see, that's another holiday classic that is a really good movie. 
So let me go ahead on here because I don't I'm talked into my time. So Ida Be- Ida Bell Wells Barnett was born July 16, 1862, and she lived until March 25th, 1931. She was an Amer- she was an American a- investigative journalist, educator, and early leader in the civil rights movement. She was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, what we now know as the NAACP, the people who are responsible for our image awards that we watch every year. So over the course of a lifetime dedicated to combating prejudice and violence and the fight for um, African-American equality, especially that of women, Miss um, Wells arguably became the most famous black woman in America. Okay. Um, Born into slavery in Holly Springs, Mississippi, Miss Wells was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation during the American Civil War. At the age of 16, she lost both her parents and her infant brother in the 1878 yellow yellow fever pandemic. She went to work and kept the rest of the family together with the help of her grandmother. Later, moving with some of her siblings to Memphis, Tennessee, she um, found better pay as a teacher. Soon, Wells co-owned and wrote for the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight newspaper. Her reporting covered racial covered incidents of racial segregation and inequality. In the 1890s, Miss Wells documented lynching in the United States. In articles, in articles, and through her pamphlet called "Southern Horrors," horrors, um, H O R R O R S. I have difficulty <laughs> of saying that word. Lynch law in all its phases investigating frequent claims of whites that lynchings were reserved for black criminals only. Miss Wells ob- exposed lynching as a barbaric practice uh, whites in the South used to intimidate and oppress African Americans who created economic and political competition. As a subsequent threat at, and a subsequent threat of loss of power for whites. In other words, it threatened, and I, I remember talking about that to someone. I said the night rides of the South, um, a lot of times they would make up like some some black person got out of line or offended somebody or looked at a white woman too hard or whatever, and they would use it as an excuse to ride. And when they would ride, anybody that they found out would possibly get lynched unless they actually already had an offending Negro in mind. And it was meant to groom Southern Blacks at that time and control them through fear. And it wasn't just lynching. Many um, young women got raped. So a white mob destroyed, uh, destroyed her newspaper office and presses as her investigative reporting was carried out nationally in Black-owned newspapers. Subjected to continued threats, Wells left Memphis for Chicago. While she was there, she married Ferdinand L. Barnett in 1895 and had a family while continuing her work writing, speaking, and organizing for civil rights and the women's movement for the rest of her life. Now, as I said before in prior um, Black History Months, many of the people that I talk about are people that you're going to say, well, wow, she couldn't have been part of the women's movement. She was actually part of civil rights. Well, most of the Black women that you hear about were, were doing double duty. And so when you hear people talk about, and I'm going to talk about this because the subject that I may cover tomorrow, I'm going to talk, discuss this week about white and, white and black feminism. And is there a difference? Because there are similarities. If, if your feminism is real, then it must include women of color.
okay? And it can't be tone deaf to other groups of women who may be suffering oppression. Okay. And it's also when I talk about, well, I, well, tomorrow night, I may, the subject may be intersection, revisiting intersectionality. And then I will go into white and black feminism at, you know, at a later date. So, um, while her work contains extensive documentation of lynchings, she was one of the first she was one of the first to do so. Her work is notable for its real-time reporting on the prevalent incendiary propaganda about black rape that was used to justify the practice. So when we talk about black rape, we're not talking about the rape of black women. We're talking about accusations of black men um, being accused of being rapists. And as I said a minute ago, um, that being the reason to night ride. So Ms. Wells was outspoken regarding her beliefs that a black female activist faced regular public public disapproval and sometimes including from other leaders within the um, civil rights movement and the women's suffragist movement. So remember, I think a couple, a little while back, I talked about first, second, and third, and fourth wave feminism. And that'll be another time that I'll revisit that. So in first wave feminism, you had what that the topic there was voter voting rights. Second wave feminism is mostly the feminism that that is associated with the 60s and on into the 70s, where you see the um, um, iconic picture of Gloria Steinem and uh, and Dorothy. Um, oh my God. Um, the, the black woman and the white woman standing side by side with their fists in the air. So they were symbols of second wave femi- feminism. Um, third wave feminism, and there are people who wonder if there is a third wave. I'm going to think, I, I'm going to say that third wave feminism was around the 90s. And the um, symbol for third wave is the third wave is um, where we started where women started suing for sexual harassment Um, Anita Hill is usually the symbol during that time fourth wave which is kind of where we might be right now um, is kind of where we are right now where we have um, meet the Me Too movement yes all women where we're starting to address concerns of safety and different stuff like that. Next month when I do 31 Days of Global Feminism, I'll be talking about how the how the um, fight for equal rights or for human rights. Um, right now we're fighting a big human rights thing because women are still being forced to marry in this country. So, you know, while people are talking about religious freedom, um, unfortunately, religious freedom is being perverted by a lot of males in authority to include um, really severe violations of women and children. So um, she was at she women's suffrage suffrages suffrage movement. She was active in women's rights and the women's suffrage movement establishing several notable women's organizations a skilled and pervasive speaker Ms. Wells traveled nationally and internationally on on lecture tours I'm trying to watch my time here um, because this may be a two-parter for her she was also in 2020 she was posthumously honored with a Pulitzer Prize special citation for her outstanding and courageous reporting on the horrific and vicious vicious violence against African Americans during the era of lynching. So in her her early life, we already touched on her um, being born in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Um, Let me see here. On the bowling farm, in July 16th, 1862. So, 
so I'm getting close here. So the podcast um, platform that I go from, which is Anchor, gives us like like 30 minute intro integrals to report our uh, podcast. So this one I think is going to be a part two because I already see the see my letter my numbers turning red. And I'm learning to pay attention to that because I hate being cut off. <laughs> and so she was the oldest child of James Madison Wells and Elizabeth Lizzie Warrington. James Wells. Okay. Thank you for, um, so this is going to be part two from this episode. Um, Like I said, I'm starting to be more sensitive to the timing on, um, with Anchor. Um, Because usually what I did in the past, whenever I was recording an episode, I would record it from my phone and then I would upload it to Anchor and then, you know, post it that way, which I may go back to doing. Uh, we're going to see. So, Miss, um, so we left off at the la- on the last um, recording by saying that um, Miss Wells was the eldest child of James Mat- Mas- Madison Wells and Elizabeth Lizzie Warrington. So, James Wells' father was a white man who impregnated an enslaved black woman named Peggy before dying. Um, Mr. Wells' father bought, brought him, age 18, to Holly Springs to become a carpenter's apprentice, where he developed a skill and worked as a hired-out slave living in town. Lizzie's experience as a slave, enslaved person was quite different. Out of one of ten children born on a plantation in Virginia, Lizzie was sold away from her family and siblings and tried without success to locate her family following the Civil War. Before the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, Wells' parents were enslaved to Spires Bowling, an an architect and the family who lived in the structure now being called Bowling Gates House. This This has now become the Ida Bell Wells Barnett Museum. After Emancipation, Wells' father, James Wells, became a trustee of Shaw College, now Russ College. He refused to vo- vote for Democrat um, Republic, de- Democrat candidates, see Southern Democrats. So the Democrats at that time were quite different from the Democrats that we have now. And I would suggest that you read up, um, read up on you know, the difference between Southern Democrats and now what we associate with the Democratic Party. Um, Don't switch over to Republicans because of what you read, because they now a day stand for completely different things than what they um, stood for back then. So during the period of Reconstruction, um, Mr. Wells became a member of the Loyal League, also known as a race man, for his involvement in politics and his commitment to the Republican Party. He founded a successful carpentry business in Holly Springs in 1869, and his wife Lizzie became known as a famous cook. Ida B. Wells was one of the eight was one of the eight, was one of the eight children, and she enrolled in the historical Black Liberal Arts College, Russ College, in Holly Springs, formerly known as Shaw College. In seven in September 7, 1878, tragedy struck the family when both of I, Ida's um, parents died ter- during a yellow fever epidemic that was also that also claimed one of her siblings. Miss Wells had been visiting her grandmother's farm near Holly Springs at the time and was spared. Following the funeral of her parents and brother, um, friends and relatives decided that the five remaining Wells children um, should be separated and sent to various foster homes. Wells resisted this proposition to keep her younger siblings together as a family. 
she found work as a teacher in a black elementary school in the country near Holly Springs. Her paternal grandmother, Peggy Wells, um, formerly known as Peggy Cheers, from 18... 14 to 1887 along with other friends and relatives stayed with her siblings and cared for them while um, she was teaching about two years after wells grandmother peggy had a stroke and her sister eugenia died wells and her two youngest sisters moved to memphis to live with an aunt fanny butler in 1883 memphis is about 56 um, miles from holly springs So now her early, early career in anti-segregation activism. So it is with, this is a quote um, from Miss Wells. It is with no pleasure that I have dipped my hands in the corruption here exposed. Somebody must show that the African-American race is more sinned against than sinning. And it seems to have fallen upon me to do so. Now, this is something she said in 1892. Um, soon after moving to Memphis, Miss Wells was hired in Woodstock by the Shelby County School System. During her summer vacation, she attended summer sessions at Fisk, Fisk University. I think Fisk is still around. A historical black college in Nashville, Tennessee. She also attended Lemoyne Owen College, a historically black college in Memphis. She held strong political opinions and provoked many people with her views on women's rights. At the age of 24, she wrote, I will not begin at this late day by doing what my soul abhors, sugaring men, weak, deceitful creatures with flattery to retain them as escorts or gratify a revenge. May 4, 1884, a train conductor with the Chesapeake and Rel and Ohio Railroad ordered Wells to give up her seat in the first class ladies car and move to the smoking car which was already crowded with other passengers. Sound familiar? The following year the United States Supreme Court had ruled against the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1875 which had banned racial discrimination in public accommodation. This verdict supported railroad companies that chose this that chose to racially segregate their passengers. Hmm. Yeah, the ruling did. This verdict, okay. Supported, yeah. The verdict. So them ruling against it um, came in support of the railroad companies that wanted to do this. When Wells refused to give up her seat, the conductor and two men dragged her out of the car. Wells gained publicity in um, Memphis when she wrote a newspaper article for The Living Way, a church weekly, about her treatment on the train. In Memphis, she hired an African-American attorney to sue the railroad. When her lawyer was paid... When her, when her lawyer was paid off by the railroad, she hired a white attorney. I know, messed up, wasn't it? She won her case in December 24th, 1884, when the local circuit court granted her a $500 reward. The railroad company appealed to the Tennessee Supreme Court, which reversed the lower court's ruling in 1887. It concluded, we think it is evident that the purpose of the defendant in error was to harass with a view to this suit and that her persistence was not in good faith to obtain a comfortable seat for the short ride. Wells was ordered to play, pay court costs. Her reaction to the higher court's decision revealed her strong conviction on civil rights and religious faith as she responded, I felt so disappointed because I'd hoped such great things from my suit for my people. Oh God, is there no justice in this land for us? While continuing to teach elementary school, um, Wells became increasingly active as a journalist and writer. She was offered an ed editorial position for the Evening Star in Washington, D.C. 
and she began writing weekly articles for the Living Way newspaper under the name Iola. Articles she wrote under her pen name attacked racist Jim Crow policies. So those of you who want to listen to Kanye talk about how racism was a choice, open up a history book. Because it more it, it was because it was more than about slavery. Once we gained our freedom, we still had to fight to um, exercise even the right to vote. We had many rights that were still stripped of us that we were not allowed to practice. So in 1889, she began she became editor and co-owner with J.L. Fleming of the Free Speech and Headlight, a black-owned newspaper. Um, established by the Reverend Taylor Nightingale and based on, at the Beale Street Baptist Church in Memphis. In 1891, Miss um, Wells was dismissed from her teaching post by the Memphis Board of Education due to her articles criticizing conditions in the black schools of the region. She was devastated but not undaunted and concentrated her, her energy on writing articles for The Living Way and the Free Speech and Headlight. Okay, so now we're going to talk about her anti-lynching campaign and, and her, her year as an investigative journalism. So, the lynching at the curb in Memphis. In 1889, Henry Thomas Moss Sr., an African-American owned the People's Grocery, which he co-owned. Opened the um, People's Gro- Grocery, which he co-owned. The store lo- was located in the South Memphis neighborhood, nicknamed The Curve. Miss Wells was close to Moss and his family, having stood as godmother to his first child, Maureen E. Moss. Moss's store did well and competed with a white-owned grocery store across the street. Barrett's Groceries, owned by William Russell Barrett. On March 2nd, 1892, a young black male youth named Armour Harris was playing a game of marbles with a young white male named Cornelius Hurst in front of the People's Grocery. The two males got in, the two male youths got into an argument and a fight during the game. As the black youth Harris began to win the fight, the father of Cornelius Hurst intervened and began to thrash Harris. The People's Grocery employees, William Stewart and Calvin R. McDowell, saw the fight and rushed in to defend the young Harris from the adult Hurst as people in the neighborhood gathered into what quickly became a racially charged mob. Mm-mm. The white grocery, the right grocer Barrett returned the following day, March 3rd, 1892, to the People's Grocery with a Shelby County Sheriff's deputy looking for um, William Stewart. But Calvin McDowell, who greeted Barrett, indicated that Stewart was not present. Barrett was dissatisfied with the response and was frustrated that the People's Grocery was competing with his store. Angry about the previous day melee, melee, um, Barrett responded that blacks, that blacks were thieves and hit McDowell with a pistol. McDowell wrestled the gun away. Well, I'm just like blacks were thieves. Of course, that's not true. Um, McDowell wrestled the gun away and fired at Barrett, missing narrowly. McDowell was later arrested, but subsequently re- released. On March 5th, 1892, a group of six white men, including a sheriff's deputy, took electric street cars to the people's to the people's grocery. The group of men were met by a barrage of bullets from the people's grocery, and Shelby County Sheriff Deputy Charlie Cole was wounded as well as civilian Bob Harrell. Hundreds of whites were deputized almost immediately to put down what was um, perceived by the local Memphis newspapers, commercial and appeal avalanche 
as an armed rebellion by black men in Memphis. Mm-mm-mm. Thomas Moss, a postman, in addition to being the owner of the People's Grocery, was named as a conspirator along with McDowell and Stewart. The three men were arrested and pending trial. Around 2.30 a.m. on the morning of March 9, 1892, 75 men wearing black masks took Moss, McDowell, and Stewart's from their jail cells at the Shelby County Jail to a Chesapeake and Ohio rail yard one north one mile north of the city and shot them dead the meet the memphis appeal avalanche reports dear miss wells thank you for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination that now is generally practiced against colored people in the south there's been no word equal to it in convincing power that i have spoken but my word is feeble in comparison brave woman this was um, frederick douglas in 1892 just before he was killed moses said to the mob tell my people to go west there's no justice here after the lynching of her friends miss wells wrote in free speech and headlight urging blacks to leave memphis altogether there is only one thing left to do save our money and leave a town that will neither protect our lives or property or give us a fair trial in the courts but takes us out and murders us in cold blood and then when accused by white persons. The event led to Miss Wells led Miss Wells to begin investigating lynchings using investigative journalist techniques. She began to interview people associated with lynchings, including a lynching in Tunica, um, Mississippi in 1892 where she concluded that the father of a young white woman had implored a lynch mob to kill a black man with whom his daughter was having a sexual relationship under a pretense to save the reputation of his daughter. The demise of the free speech newspaper under duress of threats. Miss Wells' anti-lynching commentaries in the free, in the free speech had been building, partic- had been building particularly in respect to lynchings and imprisonment of black men suspected of raping white women. A story broke out January 16, 1982 in the Cleveland Gazette um, describing a wrongful conviction of a sexual affair between a married white woman, Julia Underwood, um, and a single black man, William Offit of Valeria, Ohio. Offit was convicted of rape and served four years of a 15-year sentence despite his sworn denial of rape, the word of a black man against that of a white woman. Her husband, Reverend Isaac T. Underwood, after she confessed him two years later, diligently worked to get Offit out of the penitentiary. After hiring an influential Pittsburgh attorney, Thomas Harlan Baird Patterson, Reverend Underwood prevailed. Off, off it was um, released and subsequently pardoned by the Ohio governor. In May 21, 1892, Mel's, Wells um, published an editorial in the Free Speech refuting what she called that old threadbare lie that Negro men rape white women. If Southern men are not careful, a conclusion might be reached which will be damaging to the moral reputation of their women. The, and so another quote, the, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Ida B. Wells, 1892. Four days later, on May 25th, the um, Daily Commercial published a threat. The fact that a black scoundrel, Ida B. Wells, is allowed to live and utter such loathsome, repulsive calumnies is a, vo- is a volume of evidence to the wonderful patience of Southern whites. But, we're, but we've had enough of it. Mm-mm-mm. The evening um, scimitar copied the story the same day, more specifically raised the threat. Patience under such circumstances is not a virtue. 
If the Negroes themselves do not apply the remedy without delay, it will be the duty of those whom he has attacked to tie the wretch who utters these calamities to a stake at the intersection of Main and Madison Streets and brand, and brand him in the forehead with a hot iron and perform upon him a surgical operation with a pair of tailor shears. Okay, we're starting to get, I think, I think we gonna, this is the only one I'm going to do tonight. Um, a white mob ransacked the white speech office, destroying the building and its contents. James L. Fleming, co-owner with Wells and business manager, was forced to flee um, Memphis. And reportedly the trains um, were being watched for Wells' return. Creditors took possession of the office and sold the assets of free speech. Ms. Wells had been out of town vacationing in Manhattan, but never returned to Memphis. A committee of white businessmen reportedly from the Cotton Exchange located Reverend Nightingale, and although he'd sold his interest in Wells and, and Fleming in 1891, assaulted him and forced him at gunpoint to sign a letter retracting the May 21st um, editorial. I have said before that I don't always trust retracting, and this is why. Um, Wells subsequently accepted a job with um, New York Age and contributed her anti-lynching campaign from New York, from New York. For the next three years, she resided in Harlem, initially a guest at the home of Timothy Thomas Fortune and wife Carrie Fortune. Okay, according to, according to um, Kenneth W. Goings, Ph.D., no copy, no copy of the Memphis Free Speech survives. Our only knowledge of it comes from reprinted articles and other archived newspapers. Okay. In, uh, in October, on October 26, 1892, Miss um, Lynch, Miss Lynch, Miss Wells began to publish her research on lynching in a pamphlet called Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. Having examined many accounts of lynchings due to the alleged rape of white women, which is kind of one of the reasons we can't get a whole lot of justice now, um, she concluded that Southerners cried rape as an excuse to hide their real, re- their real li- reasons for lynchings. Black economic progress which threatened white Southerners with competition and white ideas of enforcing black second-class status in the um, society. Black economic progress was a contemporary issue in the South, as many states, as in, and in many states, blacks worked to suppress black progress. In this period, at the state of the turn of, at the turn of the century, Southern states. Um, starting with Mississippi in 1890, passed laws and or new constitutions to disenfranchise most black people and many poor white people through the use of poll tax, literary tests, and other device. Wells Barnett recommended that black people use arms to defend against racism. I mean racism, against lynching. Um, Miss Wells, in, in Southern Horrors, adopted the phrase Poor, blind, Afro-American Samsons to denote black men as victims of white Delilahs. The biblical Samson in the vernacular of the day came from Longfellow's 1865 poem, The Warning, containing the line, There is a poor, blind Samson in the land. To explain the metaphor, Samson, John Eliot Carnes, a Irish political economist, in his 1865 article about black suffrage, wrote that Longfellow was prophesizing to wit in the long-appending struggle 
four Americans following the Civil, Civil War. He, Longfellow, could see in the Negro only an instrument of vengeance and a cause of ruin. The phrase instrument of vengeance was also referred to in the 1831 work The Confessions of Nat Turner, published by Thomas Ruffin Gray, wherein Turner explains how he saw the divine signs, God's will to eradicate the evil of slavery that vindicated him as an instrument of vengeance and establish his prophetic status. However, Carnes in the article went on to explain that Longfellow's prediction did not transpire. The hour of grim level, grim le- revel at length and the American Samson raised his hand before a purpose far different than that which the poet um, dreaded, not to shake, but to stay up the tottering temple of American liberties, um, that, that temple in which he had only received insult and an unuttered wrong. Okay. I'm looking here. <laughs> it ain't turning red yet. The numbers ain't turning red yet. Um, so if you want to get some background on this, you want to look at Nat Turner's Slave Rebellion. Um, now, if you saw the movie, um, for the most recent movie called Birth of a Nation, which is the story of the Turner Rebellion, um, there's some controversy behind the movie. Because the young man who made the movie um, was, a, you know, they brought up a rape that he was accused of in college. And so there was some controversy behind it. Um, watch at your own risk. I wound up going to see it and I have to say that it is a very good movie. It is very well written. Um like I said there are a lot of women who didn't go see it because of the whole scandal in the um, young man's life so like I said before um, watch at your own risk I'm sure it's available on YouTube um, as well as a few other streaming services so now we're now we're at the red record in 1895 after conducting greater research Ms. Wells published the Red Record in 1895. This was a 100-page pamphlet with more detail describing lynching in the United States since the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. It also covered Black people's struggles in the South since the Civil War. The Red Record explored the alarmingly high rates of lynching in the United States, which was at a peak from 1880, 1880 to 1930. Wells Barnett said that during um, Reconstruction, most Americans outside the South did not realize the growing rate of violence against Black people in the South. She believed that during slavery, white people had not committed as many attacks because of the economic labor of slaves. Miss Wells noted that since slavery time, 10,000 Negroes have been killed in cold blood through lynching without the formality of judicial trial and legal execution. Frederick Douglass had written an article noting three eras, eras of Southern barbarianism and excuses that whites claimed in each period. Wells Barnett Wells Barnett explored these in detail in her um, red record. During slave time, she she noticed that whites worked to repress and stamp out alleged alleged race riots or suspected slave rebellions, usually killing black people in far higher proportions than any white casualties. Once the Civil War ended, white people feared black people who were in the majority in in many areas. White people tend acted to control them and suppress them by violence. During the the Reconstruction era, 
white people lynch black people as part of mob efforts to suppress black political activity and reestablish white supremacy after the war. They feared Negro domination through voting and taking office. Wells Barnett, okay, starting to turn red. So um, Wells Barnett urged black people in high numbers to move away to protect their families. She noticed that whites frequently claimed that black men had to be killed to avenge their assaults upon women. She noticed that white people assumed that any relationship between a white woman and a black man had to be the result of rape. But given power relationships, it was much more common for white men to take sexual advantage of poor black women. She stated, nobody in this section of the country believes the old threadbare lie that black men rape white women. Wells connected lynching to sexual violence and showed how the myth of the black man's lust Okay, so we're going into part three. Um, so Miss well- Wells Barnett gave 14 pages of statistics relating to lynching cases committed from 1892 to 1895. She also included pages of graphic accounts detailing specific lynching. She noticed that her data um, was taken from articles by white correspondents white press bureaus, and white newspapers. The red record have far-reaching influence in the debate about lynching. Southern horrors and the red record's documentation of lynchings captured the attentions of Northerners Northerners who who knew little about lynching or accepted the common explanation that black men deserve this fate. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, 4,084 African Americans were lynched in the South alone between 1877 and 1950. Yeah, that that recent. Of which 25% were accused of sexual assault and nearly 30 murder. Generally, um, there was a movie called um, about a girl named Mary Fagan. Unfortunately, in this movie, the, the guy, um, the guilty party, wound up being black. But it was about the um, clan deciding to get together. It was about the earliest origins of the clan and the their their a reason for, their excuse for organizing and in keeping with the current topic of Whoopi Goldberg, the guy who was falsely accused was a was a white Jew. Um basically talking about how common and the the young girl um was raped you know but um it was one of those cases like most of these cases just like the Emmett Till case where these black men would be accused you know like I said it was an excuse to march at night um to night ride it was also a way of keeping economic power over the blacks that were there so we don't ever want to get this confused and read it too well black men don't ever rape white women black men rape black women some do the majority don't (laughs) so we're talking about innocent parties here um, before I go on with the rest of this so generally southern states and white juries refuse to indict any perpetrator perpetrators for lynching um, although there were frequently they were frequently known and sometimes so, shown in the photographs being made more frequently of such um, events now I'm sure you probably have seen pictures of white men who posed next to um, black bodies that were the bodies of lynched individuals almost like they're posing next to a big mouth bass, a fish that they caught. Um, Very chilling pictures um, of this nation's history. So despite Miss Wells Barnett's attempt to gather, to garner support amongst white Americans against lynching, she believed that her campaign could not overturn the economic interests 
whites had in using lynching as an instrument to maintain Southern order and discourage black economic ventures. That was the real reason behind the lynchings. Okay. Ultimately, Wells Barnett, don't be Republican. <laughs> that's, that's not the message that we get in here. But when you think about people who keep people down, so ultimately, Wells Barnett um, concluded that appealing to reason and compassion would not succeed in gaining criminalization of lynching by Southern whites. Wells Barnett concluded that perhaps armed resistance was the only defense against lynching. Meanwhile, she extended her efforts to gain support of such powerful white nations as Britain to shame and sanction the racist practices of America. Speaking tours in Britain. This is when things get interesting. Wells traveled twice to Britain in her campaign against lynching. The first time in 1893 and the second in 1894. She and her um, supporters in America saw these tours as an opportunity for her to reach larger white audiences with her anti-lynching campaign, something that she had been able to, un, able to accomplish in America. She found sympathetic audiences in Britain, already shocked by reports of lynching in America. Wells had been invited by her for her first speak, British speaking engagement tour by Catherine Empey and Isabella Fivey Mayo. Empey, a Quaker abolitionist who had pu published the journal Anti-Caste, had um, attended several of Wells' lectures while traveling in America. Mayo was a well-known writer and poet who wrote under the name Edward Garrett. A common practice back then because, you know, women's rights. Both women had read of the particularly gruesome lynching of Henry Smith in Texas and wanted to organize a speaking tour to call attention to American lynchings. Empey and Mayo asked Frederick Douglass to make the trip, but he declined citing his age and health. He then suggested Wells, who enthusiastically accepted the invita invitation in 1894, before um, leaving the U.S. for her second visit to Great Britain, Wells called on Win William Penn Nixon, the editor of the Daily Interocean, a Republican newspaper in Chicago. It was the only major white paper that persistently denounced um, lynching. After she told Nixon about her planned tour, he asked her to write for the newspaper while in England. She was the first African-American woman to be a paid correspondent for a mainstream white paper. Miss um, Wells uh, Miss Wells toured England, Scotland, and Wales for two months addressing audience audiences of thousands and rallying a moral crusade amongst the British. She relied heavily on her pamphlet, Southern Horrors, for her first tour and showed shocking photographs of actual lynchings in America. Um, on May 17, 1894, she spoke in Birmingham at the Young Man's Christian Academy. Now, you've heard of the Young Man's Christian Academy. Um, we know it as the YMCA. And at Central Hall, staying in Ed, Edge Baston at 66 Goo Road. At the last night of her second tour at the London Anti Lynching Committee, the, the, the London Anti Lynching Committee, the London Anti Lynching Committee was established and reportedly the first anti lynching organization in the world. Its founding members included many notables, such as the Duke of Argyll. Sir John Gorst, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lady Somerset, and some 20 members of Parliament. With act, with, wasn't, wasn't I to be a badass? <laughs> with um, activist Florence um, Balgarney as the Honorary Secretary. 
As a result of her two lecture tours in Britain, she received significant coverage in the British and American press. Many of the articles published by the latter at the time of her return to um, the United States were hostile personal critiques rather than reports of her anti-lynching um, positions and beliefs. The New York Times, for example, called her a slanderous and nasty, nasty-minded, doesn't that sound familiar? A slanderous and nasty, nasty-minded mulattress. Now, I don't know if she was a mulatto or not, but do you remember the quote, nasty women? <laughs> right? So women who stand up for themselves, that's why I always take it with a grain of salt when a guy calls a woman difficult. And I'm going to talk about that this month too. Despite the attacks from the American press, Wells had nevertheless gained extensive recognition and credibility and an international audience of supporters for her cause. So, marriage and family. In June June 27, 1895, in Chicago at Bethel AMA Church, Mrs. Wells um, wed attorney Ferdinand L. Barnett. A widower with two sons, Ferdinand Barnett and Albert Graham Barnett. Ferdinand Lee Barnett, who lived in Chicago, was a prominent attorney, civil rights activist, and journalist. Like Wells, he spoke widely against um, lynchings and for the civil rights of African Americans. Wells and Barnett met in 1893 and worked together on a pamphlet protesting the lack of black representation at the World's Columbian uh, Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Miss um, Barnett, Barnett founded the Chicago Conservator, the first black um, newspaper in Chicago. In 18 18- 78, Miss Barnett began writing for the paper and in 19, 1893 later acquired a partial ownership interest and after marrying Barnett assumed the role of editor. Miss Wells' marriage to Barnett was a legal union as well as a partnership of ideas and action. Both, both were journalists and <laughs> And both were established activists with a shared commitment to civil rights. In an interview, Wells' daughter, Alfreda, said that the two um, had like interests and that their journalist career were intertwined. This type of close working relationship between a wife and husband was unusual at the time, as women often played more traditional domestic roles in, in a marriage. In addition to Barnett's two children from Ferdinand's previous um, marriage, the two had four more kids. Um, Charles Aiket Barnett, Herman um, Colstead Barnett, Ida Bell Wells Barnett Jr., and Alfreda Marguerite Barnett. Um, So let me see, what's... um, The youngest daughter lived until um, 1983. Um, so I'm had to look look. I'm at the. I might have to give her a mention this month. Um, Charles Aiket Burnett, um, middle name was the namesake of Charles Frederick Aiket, an influential British turned American progressive Protestant clergyman who, in 1894, while pastor of the Pembroke. Baptist Church in Liverpool, England, befriended Bar- Miss Wells and endorsed her anti-lynching campaign, and hosted her during her speaking tour in England in 1894. In a cha- chapter of Wells' posthumous humus, um, autobiography, Crusade for Justice, um, titled "A Divided Duty." She described the difficult challenge of splitting her time between family and work. She continued to work after the birth of her first child, traveling and bringing the infant Charles with her. Although she tried to balance her roles as a mother and as a national activist, 
it was challenged that she was not always successful. Susan B. Anthony said she seemed distracted. That distracted in quotes. Her establishment of Chicago's first kindergarten, prioritizing black children, located in the lecture room of the Bethel AME Church, demonstrates how her public activism and her personal life were connected. As her great granddaughter, Michelle Duster, notes, when her older children started getting of school age, then she recognized that black children did not have the same type of educational um, opportunities as other students. And her attitude, and so her attitude was, well, since it doesn't exist, we'll create it ourselves. Yes, I snapped. <laughs> so let me see here. Oh, Lord have mercy. So African American leadership. The 19th century's acknowledged leader for African American civil rights, Frederick Douglass, praised Miss Wells' work while um, giving her instruct introductions and sometimes financial support for her in- investigations. When he died in 1895, Miss Wells was perhaps at the height of her notoriety. But as many men and women were ambivalent, ag- or, be- uh, be- ambivalent or against a woman taking the lead in black civil rights at a time when women were not seen as and often not allowed to be leaders by the wider society, for the new leading voices, Booker T. Washington and his rival W.E.B.D. W.E.B. Du Bois, du Bois and um, other traditionally minded women activists, Wells often came to be seen as too radical. Miss um, Wells encountered and sometimes collaborated with the others, but they also had many disagreements while competing for attention for their ideas and programs. For example, there were, there are different accounts of why well, Miss Wells' name was excluded from the original list of founders for the NAACP. In his autobiography, Dusk of Dawn, Dubois implied that Wells chose not to be included. However, in her um, autobiography, Miss Wells stated that Dubois deliberately included, excluded her from the list. Organizing in Chicago. So having settled in Chicago, Miss Wells continued her anti-lynching work while becoming more focused on the civil rights of African Americans. Um, she worked with national civil rights leaders to protest a large exhibition she was active in. She was active in the um, National Women's Club movement, and she ultimately ran for the Illinois State Senate. She was also passionate about women's rights and suffrage. She was a spokeswoman and an advocate for women being successful in the workplace, having equal opportunities, and creating a name for themselves. Wells was an active member of the National Equal Rights League, (laughs) NURL, founded in 1864 and was their president, their representative calling on was their representative calling on President Woodrow Wilson to end discrimination in government jobs. In 1914, she served as president of Neural Chicago Bureau, um, the World's Columbian Exposition. In 1893, the World's Columbian Exposition was held in Chicago. Together with Frederick Douglass and other black leaders, Wells organized a black boycott of the fair for the fair's lack of representation of African American achievement in the exhibits. Wells, Ir- Irvine, Garland Penn, and Wells' future husband, Ferdinand L. Um, Barnett, wrote sections of the pamphlet, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Col- Columbian Exposition, which detailed the progress of Blacks since their arrival in America and also exposed the basis of Southern lynchings. Miss Wells later um, reported to Abby Albion Tor, W. Torgy that copies of the pamphlet have been distributed to, to more than 20,000 people at the fair. That year she started work with the um, Chicago Conservator, the oldest African American newspaper in the, in the city. So let me see here. 
Okay, so we, uh, I am now on part three of this. So I'm not going to read the rest of it because, you know, she established a lot. However, I will say this. If you want to read the rest of Miss Wells' story, Miss Wells Barnett's story, I am the, 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 I, the, the source for all of the information that I'm getting is Wikipedia. So if you want to read the rest of the work and her notable accomplishments, you can um, finish. You can go to Wikipedia and finish. Okay, let me see here. So let me... if you want to read the rest of her accomplishments because she also was quite um, active in um, women's suffrage which we talked about already let me see here so let me talk about her influence on black feminist activism so Miss Wells Barnett explained that the defense of white women's honor allowed Southern white men to get away with murder by projecting their own history of sexual violence onto black men. Her call for all races and genders to be accountable for their actions showed African-American women that they can speak out and fight for their rights. By portraying the horrors of lynching, she worked to show that racial and gender discrimination are linked, furthering the black feminist cause. Okay. So the rest, and um, there are other connected articles, um, such as Alfreda Duster, which is um, one of, I think, one of her youngest children. Um, The People's Grocery Lynching, which is the actual, a more detailed um, account of the the, um, actions that we talked about earlier with the People's Grocery Store. And the Alpha Suffrage Club, which, um, like I said, was a part of first wave feminism. So I'm going to go ahead. If you all want to look up the information, um, further information on Miss Wells, um, it is included in Wikipedia amongst other sources. So since this one took so long tonight, because it looks like this was a three-parter, this is the only one I'm going to do tonight. Um, I will be doing two more tomorrow night. Um, Thursday and then Friday I am not going to do them because I have Friday morning live and um, live broadcast Friday night so um, I am going to post this tonight right now I am trying to um, get I'm trying to get it together to be able to turn the um I am uh, I am probably going to be working over the weekend or the next couple days trying to get the um, trying to turn these podcasts into videos so I can post them on YouTube, um, which is turning into a very daunting t- task because the app that I use to do this is not cooperating with me right now. Um, so I am going to go ahead and get off here. Um, I will be posting again tomorrow night. Tomorrow, like I said, tomorrow night I may do a notable and a topic depending on how long the notables, um, the notables um, story is because Miss because Miss Barnett took me a minute. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get off of here. Um, you guys enjoy your um, hump day. Today is Wednesday, right? So enjoy your hump day um, or your hump going into <laughs> third, your Wednesday going into Thursday. Enjoy all of that. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. You have a good one and be blessed. Smooches. Hello, you have reached the message line for Adam's Rib Media Ministry. If you would like to give me a shout out, recommend some topics for discussion, or give an opinion about a topic I've already discussed, either on my blogs or here on my podcast, leave a message and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.